Welcome everyone to this session at the Economist Impacts Conference on the Innovation at Work in the uh, United States. My name is Arjun Ramani and I'm the Global Business and Economics Correspondent for The Economist. Um, so this specific session today will be on strategies for surviving the talent shortage, um, which all business leaders will know is a, is a serious issue. So before I introduce our speakers, I just want to provide some context for the, the event motivated a bit. So we're in a very strange macroeconomic climate right now. We have an extremely tight labor market combined with tightening financial conditions that have already hit markets and may lead to a general economic slowdown. Uh, this is increasing the need for firms to hire workers who are future proof and can adapt to future ch shocks. And, and given the fact that uh, you know, workforces have more demands for workers and there are uh, people who are willing to work at the moment, it also increases the demand to bring workers off the sidelines, which requires training on the job. That's all easier said than done, um, which is why uh, we have the topic of our discussion today, uh, strategies for surviving the talent shortage. Um, so just to briefly introduce our panelists, we have uh, Jim Swanson, who's the executive vice president and chief information officer of Johnson & Johnson. Um, we also have Karen uh, Kimbrough, chief economist of LinkedIn. Um, we have Roshan Navagamoa, the Executive Vice Pres President and Chief Information Officer of CVS Health. And finally, we have Lori Chamberlain, President of LHH Recruitment Solutions North America, uh, a part of the ADECO Group. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, so to kick us off with a kind of broad question, um, I'd like to start with the state of the labor market in the United States at the moment. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the labor market uh, and trends with your recruitment strategies at, at the moment? So maybe um, I'll turn it over to, to, to Karen if you'd like to, to kick us off um, and then we can open it up to the broader panel. Sure. Um, thanks a lot, Arjun. Um, I would say, you know, overall, what we're seeing in the labor market is that it's um, it's still a tight labor market, uh, obviously not as tight as it was uh, maybe a year ago. Um, and job seekers, um, while they still hold some cards, don't hold all the cards. Um, one of the things that's most interesting in our data right now is the fact that um, even with unemployment very, very low and employers um, still, you know, kind of wondering how to navigate the uncertainty that we're, we're, we're in, they, we do see that job seekers are beginning to seek with more intent. They're applying to more roles. They're um, viewing them fewer times before they apply. So that, that sort of job seeking behavior is starting to kind of intensify. Um, it's not the same, of course, for all sectors. And I guess my panelists here will kind of weigh in on different sectors, but we're definitely seeing some sectors as tighter than others. Thanks, Karen. And, and I assume that's uh, that's with the LinkedIn data that you're you're talking about Absolutely. when people are viewing yeah, jobs the on the platform. Data. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Makes a lot of sense. Um, Lori, I think you you had something you want to add. Yeah, I so I completely agree with Karen. And what is super interesting is even though we're seeing inflation, lots of discussion about a recession. In a recent study that we did among our candidates seeking employment. The reality is 61% of them still feel confident they could have another job secured in less than six months, which is really unusual in this kind of economic climate. In, in normally in a recession, you see a lot of people get really nervous about leaving or exploring. But again, 61% currently think I could land another job that I would prefer over my current job in less than six months. So that's highly unusual for this kind of economic condition. Yeah, Jim. Uh, being in healthcare, um, as we look at technology, it's critical as, as we think about our future in healthcare. And so what we've seen is our attrition rates overall being healthy, but then when you unpack it and look at it, certain skill sets that are highly sought after, we still struggle there um, to retain those employees because there's so much demand or to hire them. So if a, you're a data scientist, uh, for every four job openings, there's maybe one really good qualified data scientist. So I think you really got to unpack into subsegments of the skill set. And then in there, that's where you really find where you're maybe challenged. And I do believe the labor market's getting a little bit better, back both to Lori and, and Karen's point. Uh, but that subsegmentation based on skill set is where you really get to the root of how, how you're doing and, and what's in the marketplace. 
in Russian, please feel free. Yeah, Arjun, just to follow on from you know Jim's point, we, we are seeing it get a bit better to the points being made. Um, the other thing that, you know, as I spend time with candidates, um, I, I'm, I'm hearing a few things. One is, uh, when I ask the question, um, why are you looking, right, and why us? Um, what I hear a lot from people is, um, I'm looking for something where I can find um, a greater purpose, and I'm really, really looking for something where, you know, I can find a, a mission that I can can get behind, um, and looking for a way to play a meaningful role relative to that mission. So I'm hearing a lot of that language around meaningful work and mission for companies. I think, you know, as Jim pointed out, in healthcare. I think we're, we're maybe at a point where people are turning to companies like us to say, listen, we've seen you all on the front lines of, you know, a pandemic response and, and other things, and we're paying more attention to companies like you um, that have a social component to what you're doing. So that's one kind of observation I have in the market. Um, I, you know, absolutely second Jim's point around, you know, there are some very, very hot skills and we're seeing a lot of churn in kind of the hottest skills, you know, things that are around AI enablement, um, you know, is, is an area that um, you know, we, can't, we can't find enough, right? And so a lot of this is also has to come down to, you know, what are the steps that companies need to take in terms of helping groom grow talent, you know, in order to fill that shortage. So it's not just about kind of canvassing the market for what's available, but also how do we groom that? That makes a lot of sense. And the point on workers looking for mission and meaning is really interesting. Is that cyclical? So is that something that kind of grows in when you have tighter labor markets? Because, you know, the, I guess the uh, when employers and employees are kind of bargaining, it's more of an, a, an employee's market and they can kind of search a little bit more for a company that best fits their kind of broader goals. Maybe Roshan, if you want to. Yeah, I I think so. I think I think it's a, well. I think it's two things. I think one is what you just said. I think in a job seekers market, you know, you do have the ability to do that. The other thing I think is, you know, with the pandemic, you know, people refactored what's really important to them. You know, and I think that's again part of the macro macro trend of you know. We, we need more talent is people are making choices about, you know, how to, how to spend their day, how to spend their time and um, where they want to burn their calories. And I think they're being super intentional, more intentional than they've ever been before. Um, you know, job seekers market or not. Um, and, you know, I think those are the two things that, that play a role. That makes sense. And I guess look, looking forward, um, you know, it seems like we're going to see the, the labor market cool off a bit because the central banks are not, not taking their, their um, feet off the, the pedal. Um, and that kind of raises the question of, you know, building a, a, a workforce that's um, resilient or resistant to, you know, these, these future, future shocks. So maybe, maybe I'll turn to kind of our second theme of discussion, which is on building, a, you know, this concept of future-proof workforce. It's kind of one of those business buzzwords important to pin down concretely. Um, so maybe, yeah, uh, uh, you know, Lori, maybe do you want to, do you want to start with this? What is your, how would you describe a so-called future-proof workforce? What are, what are your best practices for, for creating one? And then we'll open it up. So, so one thing that I think is absolutely, um, true is that purpose has become part of the uh, discussion point for the employee. And I don't know that companies have really thought about how do they externally share what their mission is and what the, what the candidate will achieve in terms of, are they going to be a lifelong learner? Are they going to be there for a project? Are they going to acquire a new skill set on the job? Are they just going to be a cog in the wheel? And I think, unfortunately, a lot of companies still have outdated hiring practices where they put a candidate through multiple steps and multiple processes and, and don't necessarily talk about 
what it will be like to work in that environment from the employee's perspective and the employee's viewpoint. We're hearing a lot about psychological safety and, and mental wellness. Uh, and, and that's not just about mental health, that's mental wellness. And, and what, are you gonna go to a four day work week and is there a stigma associated with, with people who choose to do that versus people who don't choose to do that? People who work in the office versus who don't work in the office, what are the different stigmas associated with that? And again, I don't think that the hiring practices have caught up in being able to articulate a clear message to a candidate. So future proofing the workforce, frankly, is just making sure, do we have our, our internal um, narrative figured out and do we buy into it and do we believe it so that if I talk to five different people in the organization, we're all singing from the same songbook. The other thing that I think is super interesting and then I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists um, is that career conversations aren't taking place with the current employee workforce. And that is a massive missed opportunity. So let's say Karen is really considering whether this is still the job for her. And she reports to me, if she doesn't feel comfortable having that conversation that she might want to move to Jim's department, even though she doesn't have the traditional skill set for Jim's department, if we don't have that conversation with each other, she will leave and go to another company versus if she came to me and I wasn't selfish about trying to hoard Karen or talk her out of why she does or doesn't have the skill set for Jim's thing. There's a missed opportunity in organizations to, to look at their workforce as movable in the workforce if they have the aptitude and the attitude for the job that they wanna pursue, even if they don't have the traditional experience. And I think that's a real missed opportunity in organizations, but Karen is three times more likely to stay in the organization if she can have that conversation with me. Yeah, Karen. Please follow on. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I just maybe want to pick up on that point that Laurie was was speaking to. Um, one of the things that we see at LinkedIn in our data is that um, internal mobility, I think, is really a key retention tool. Uh, we find that employees stay twice as long on average. And again, I'm averaging across, you know, 850 million profiles on LinkedIn. So it's that's a big average. Um, but employees are likely to stay twice as long at a company when they have um, internal mobility opportunities as uh, when they don't. Um, and the other thing I would I would say, um, in addition to that, thinking about how do you future proof the workforce? So, you know, one being this idea of like me trying to retain the great talent you have is also thinking about that lifelong learning, which is I know a little corny, but it's really true. Uh, when we look at how jobs have changed even in the last five to seven years, we can look at a job posting and say, what are the top 10 or 15 core skills required by an employer for this job that they posted? We can see that that has changed in the last five to seven years by almost 25%. So the skills are rotating and changing, which means whatever job you're doing right now, even if you don't change that job five years from now, that job's gonna be looking for slightly different skills. I mean, some skills never change. A lot of the soft skills are perennial. But a lot of the technical and digital skills that I think that Roshan and Jim are speaking to, those are in hot demand and they do evolve. Um, and so I think investing in your talent, uh, which is my second point, is really critical uh, to future proofing the workforce, whether you're from the employer standpoint of wanting to retain talent or the employees uh, standards, um, which is like, I want to be invested in. And we know that's really important to workers. That's a really good point for, um, from both of you, and I, I wonder maybe turning to Jim and, and Roshan as business leaders of, of very uh, large organizations. Um, yeah, are, are you increasing your your um, you know use of uh, these tools? Are you seeing? Or are you attempting to kind of try to move people between divisions more as as a as a form of retention? Or or yeah, how is that working out? Um, maybe uh, Jim, if you want to start, and then Roshan or. Um, so thanks. Um, maybe I'd start with uh, the employee value proposition. How well have we defined that for employees and, and, and what do they need along that journey? The joke I have with my organization is the half-life of an IT professional is about 18 months. Because technology is constantly evolving and iterating, and if, to Karen's good point, if we're not a continual learning organization, you're not relevant. And if you're not relevant, you're not adding the value you need to have. 
we, we've done a lot of investment in skill definition, what skills are critical to make the organization what I call future ready. Um, we then used AI to be able to determine, we did uh, use AI with some correlated data to give each individual a skills assessment against these core skills, technical skills, soft skills, leadership skills. I now have a heat map of my whole organization around where the proficiencies are, where they're not. We then link that to continual learning, so Udacity, Pluralsight, uh, uh, learning journeys that allows folks to upskill, and then we tied that to uh, career planning so that they now can get, they're getting the skills, they know that those are defined and needed, and now we're putting into marketplace gigs or opportunities within the company so they can develop that skill, whether it's in my organization or in other parts of the company. The other thing that we've been doing, and I just had a presentation I gave to the exec committee on the update, how we're building a digital acumen of 144,000 employees. You can't just do the IT function. The whole organization has to have, this is part of what I call the AND strategy. Great science, great reputation, great mission, and great technology. And that actually helps us also externally recruiting. We have to talk about how technology is embedded into our core mission of healthcare, and Roshan's point is spot on. People are coming to us because of that mission, but now they see their skills being really valued into the core of the company strategy. And we're doing a number of external branding campaigns to highlight the role technology is playing, whether you're in my organization, you're in commercial, you're in marketing, you're in finance. We're developing those skills to make digital natives across the whole company. When you do that really well, you grow organically and inorganically, you really maximize your mission and you embed it is how the company operates for the future. So we've had a lot of success in doing that. Um, uh, and we have huge uptake across the company and we're measuring it for results. That's, that's super interesting, this idea of defining skills and kind of identifying the skills necessary for other roles within your organization, providing a map to, to get there. Um, I, I, and what we're going to turn to next is looking outside the firm. And I wonder, you know, how much you can, you can, you know, do that for identifying pathways, uh, you know, between firms and from college to school and so forth. But before that, Roshan, did you want to weigh in at all on, on your perspective on this um, from, you know, at, at CVS? I did. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll build on what, what the other panelists have said. Um, I just want to come back to the point Lori made around a real commitment to a combination of psychological safety um, you know, as, as kind of a really fundamental um, aspect of an organization's culture. I think it's really important, um, coupled with a sense of creating belonging within that company. I think that psychological safety and belonging kind of go hand in glove. And I think if you get that part right from a cultural standpoint, then you can do some of the other things that, you know, Jim and Karen were talking about. So I think that's a really important base layer. Um, the other things that I would kind of plus in terms of what Jim was saying is, you know, in addition to the skills, the other thing that you know I've I've seen and, and we're leaning into is this notion of um, empowering teams and and you know individuals where you know there really has to be a shift from kind of a hierarchical um, you know top down goal setting and, and prescription um, type of management style to one where you really give product teams a overarching objective and they're able, they have the flexibility and the decision rights to be able to kind of build their own roadmaps and, and work in the ways that work best for that team, right? So it's not just the individual, but for that team. And what you do with that is you then, you know, give people a combination of that meaningful work they're looking for the flexibility decision right so that you know they're able to practice their craft right i mean that's a really important concept especially with technology professionals and you're giving them kind of a a, a mission right with an objective to go after and i think the combination of those things then allows them to really strive and feel like they're being challenged and and, and can aspire to to stretch themselves so i think it's a really important thing with with empowered teams the last thing i'll add is you know in addition to kind of empower teams and, and uh, learning orientation and, and the belonging aspects of it, the, you know, one of the most important things is what you were talking about with um, kind of opportunities where 
what we've started to do is ex introduce a, at CVS, in introduce a talent experience platform where people can, you know, kind of in a self-directed way, you know, work on growing their skills, work on growing their careers based on others like me, so to speak, um, as well as go there to find gigs that they can do in addition to kind of the, their primary role. So the way, that we, the way we're starting to think about it is, you don't have to think about mobility, internal mobility, as going from one role to another necessarily. Because um, that's a big kind of step function change from a career perspective. What we're saying is we're actually going to give you kind of smaller bites at the apple, if you will, with internal gigs through this talent experience platform. So you can be a software engineer, but you can have a gig doing something related to um, ESG, for example. Um, and so forth, right? So you're really kind of giving people a little bit more opportunity in smaller bite-sized chunks to be able to grow and stretch and then figure out what they actually like doing, right? So that they have micro steps versus these, these, these bigger steps. So that's the other thing that we're starting to really lean into. It's really neat gig work within the firm. <laughs> Jim, did you have something you wanted to add there? Yeah, I would just add that two points I think Roshan made was really excellent. Uh, we've also anchored around high performing teams. And just to build one other data point to the good point Rashawn made is you got a very diverse skill set around that team. It's an empowered team, I agree 100% is what we're also building. And it's a diverse team that they learn from each other with a common set of OKRs. Everybody's got the same objective. Everybody's got this same key results. You empower that team. My job as a leader is to remove bureaucracy and get things out of the way and empower that team. When you do that, you not only have extremely bright individuals, but they bring their expertise to a common problem that we're trying to solve for, whether it be in patient care, whether it be in supply chain management, whether it be in employee experience. It is truly transfer transformational how they learn and they bond in that kind of setting. So um, really important as, as uh, we've also done that. And then the same thing to build on Roshan's point, we also have marketplace gigs through a, a tool but it's tied to this end-to-end -end view. You don't just do training on its own. You don't do skill assessment on its own. You've got to see, the employee has to see it connected. That's where we anchor back to the employee value proposition. And then from the time they hire to the time they retire, what does that EVP look like for them? And it could take different paths. But that's why also I want to reinforce, you've got to get your whole C-suite there. It's not just the IT organization. The whole C-suite has to think that way because I'll move people from my organization into pharmaceuticals or into med tech or into commercial or R&D or, or finance because it's development opportunity. And I want some of those folks to take on big programs that are IT related because they're gonna develop their expertise or come to me. So you gotta get the company there, not just the function. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, and one quick question before we move on to our next topic of talent pipelines. Um, I'm just curious, how widespread is the use of these uh, tools that we've been discussing, you know, these ideas of internal skills maps, um, or, you know, gig work within the firm and so forth. Uh, yeah, do, do any of you have a sense of, is this kind of, you know, a, a niche thing that's on the, the cutting edge a few firms are doing, or is it really widespread in, in most major enterprises nowadays? Um, curious if any of you have thoughts. Okay, so, so I would say just for the client companies that we work with, there are some that do it really, really well, and they have invested in it and they believe in it. And to Jim and Roshan's point, the entire organization is behind it. There are others that it's an HR initiative that nobody else in the business knows or really cares about or uses. So, so we're seeing more of it, but what we're not seeing is 100% buy into it. I, I would say that I'm seeing it more and more with the talent scarcity that has happened in the last couple of years of what are we gonna do? We're in crisis mode. And, and I hear this from government officials, I hear it from public private sector that, that we've gotta get our talent situation under control. So I think we're getting more adoption, but we're still at early stages for most organizations, even if they have the tools at their disposal. Interesting. Karen, do you wanna to add to that? All right, I'll start again. I was just going to add that uh, one of the things that we are seeing increasingly is that employers are shifting tactics um, and really focused on skills to the point that Jim and Rashawn are making around the importance of like skill mapping and thinking about giving people opportunities at small bites of the apple to expand their portfolio of skills. 
Um, and so employers that we're seeing um, have increased even in the last year by 30 percent their reliance on looking at skills as opposed to, let's say, specific um, academic credentials for a lot of roles. Um, and part of that has to do with like the hunt for talent and the shortage of talent. Uh, but part of it's also just realizing that, you know, we, we've always said like skills are the currency of the workforce. The fact that skills really are the atomized aspect that gets the work done. And any employee brings some complex combination of skills. You may not realize all the skills your employees have. And so focusing on skills kind of lets you unlock the value that uh, employees and, and candidates can bring. Um, so we're seeing an increased skill focus definitely in the last year or two. That's super interesting. And it's a very natural segue to the kind of third pillar of our conversation on, on uh, you know, building talent pipelines um, to combat talent shortages. Um, so yeah, maybe um, we can, we can kick off right where, where Karen ended her last point. I mean, you know, the natural question um, there is how do you, you know, uh, know how skilled someone is um, outside of looking at credentials or their past experiences in a sense, like what, what do you do? Um, and in, in, in general, I'm curious to hear from all of you, you know, what, what are your organizations doing to, to kind of externally look for new sources of, of, of talent? Um, maybe Karen, do you want to, do you want to build off where you left off? Sure. I can kick it off. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is that um, maybe in pilot mode, so this is not that widespread, is the idea that um, there might be tests um, or assessments that you can provide candidates. So even if they fall what, outside the range of what you typically think are the requirements for a role, if someone has the experience, you can kind of give them an assessment and get a sense if the skills are actually there. Um, but it is, it is hard to know. Um, if someone says that they're proficient in a coding language, are they, you know, one year proficient or have they been working in that language for five years? So there's a big difference. Um, and so, so it is hard to know, but assessments can help. Endorsements, um, you know, on our platform sometimes can help as well. Uh, but it definitely is a pilot for us, um, this idea of like trying to do skills-based hiring. But we really think that this is the way forward. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, Jim, how, how, are, you, how are you guys uh, um, looking at this? Well, I'll start with where, where, how we looked at it internally and how that spills into externally. So when I talked about the AI model, we actually pulled data from a number of different sources. We have de-identified data of people that have certain skills. They might be in tech companies, what have you, that we're able to pull that data, like a data scientist, an engineer, et cetera. We then correlate that and pull data from internal sources. It might be Workday as our HR platform. It might be GitHub where our developers are actually writing code. It might be other data sources that they're, you're, they're using. And then we have the model interpret or assess or infer their skill level. We then give that to the employee. The employee then looks at it, says whether they think that's right or not, and they can correlate. And then we give the same data set to their manager. And then they also correlate. And what you see is you get three different ways to assess or infer a skill correlated, collected across three groups. And what we found, we've done this a couple of iterations, the confidence level and the correlation level has gotten really, really good. The first time it was it was so-so. The second time we did it, it got better. Third time, as we had more data insights, now we actually have a good model that we actually refresh every six months or so as people are going through courses, they're doing the journey mapping, they're doing their uh, career experience or gigs, and we're seeing an uplift that's highly correlated. So that's how we've been doing it internally. And now we're trying to get the whole organization to adopt that as we've done it in other groups now. And now I actually have a data set to compare with external candidates more so than just references. I can look deeper around certain individuals or I can assess based on what they say where our organization is at. So it's not perfect, but we're using AI with those different data sources to, to uh, really better assess the skills we think that are critical to the future and uh, based on the feedback from the employee base and that we're tying it to the employee value proposition. It's had a big impact. The other point that I would make, we didn't highlight, um, HR processes need to change. I think Karen and Lori were indicating we got to change our process, whether it be talent recruitment. Think about how you reward and compensate based on skills, not just based on I achieved 10 objectives. It's an and, not an or, but that's a very different model for HR to think about. So I'm working with our HR colleagues and we're using my organization as a pilot. How do we reward and incent with a combination now of skill uplift and outcome and capabilities of traditional and put those two things together? 
Because if you don't incent that behavior, you're not going to drive it. So that's another element of the knock-on effect of thinking differently around talent, all the things you need to do to enable that at scale. That's really interesting. Maybe just a quick follow-up there so I understand what you're, what you're referring to. Is the idea that you know, internally within the organization, you're able to, you, you can measure uh, you know, employee output based on you know, their, their manager's valuation. You have lots of other metrics. You can also do assessments, and then you can use that to kind of, hey, let's you know give a test to to a potential candidate outside the firm, and then you have all the data from you know your existing employee base that will allow you to to kind of make a prediction on someone outside the firm. Is that is that kind of what you're saying, or how, how did yeah? We haven't evolved it to you know applying an AML to an external person. We're doing it all internal, but we now have better insights around what what does good look like because now you've got external validation of de-identified data, you have internal data through your workday and, their, and the employee's workflows, and then you've got an employee as well as a manager validation. And I have a heat map now uh, on each skill set, low, medium, high, and I could tell you, here was an interesting artifact that came out of this assessment. Intelligent automation is one of the core skills we said we wanted to develop. And I had some really good automation engineers in the organization. When I looked at the manager level, they did not have the automation skills. And so you had managers leading technical teams didn't have the skills that they needed to really lead. They had other skills, certainly as leaders, but they didn't have the core technical skills. It was an observation I only got through this process. And so we're a lot smarter about how do we look at external talent now, but we're also more driving, and we'll get into the diversity side of it, uh, doing uh, hiring employees that don't have a college degree, but they have the aptitude for certifications. And we could see their productivity because we're measuring performance of product teams, looking at velocity, employee engagement, uh, their skill development over time. So we're starting to correlate all this data to get us to a better place to develop internally and to identify and attract externally. Super interesting. Yeah, Lori, please take it off. So so I want to piggyback on something that Jim said, and that is one thing we're seeing is companies saying, you know what, don't don't just recruit somebody for us because we know some of this talent isn't out there. We're interested in a recruit, train, deploy model. And versus sending them to a boot camp or a skills assessment where they get a certification, but they don't have any practical knowledge for the organization, it might be that we partner with Roshan's organization on what project is he looking for, what skill set is he looking for, and then our our instructors actually become embedded in the project with these students that they're they're like online apprentices with a boot camp that's actually doing the work at CVS while they're getting that skill set and they have an instructor that is helping them achieve CVS's mission but also not burden Roshan's current leaders with a bunch of talent that we call almost ready talent. And so we're seeing a lot about this recruit train deploy model, which is really embedding the training and the boot camp in partnership with the company. And that's something that we haven't seen before outside of kind of a traditional apprenticeship or a skills, but I don't have the actual practical experience and, and that disconnect there. The other thing that we're seeing is a lot of returnships. How do I bring people back into the organization that might have left the workforce and they've got a lot of good knowledge and maybe they don't have the technical skills that other people might think they're not fit for the future. But to Jim's point, they have the aptitude to do the job and they've got some transferable skills and they're willing to get upskilled on the technical piece. Those are, those are also an untapped population that are really changing the game for some organizations that are willing to do that. That's really interesting. Um, recruit, train, deploy, I like that. Uh, Roshan, do you want to build on that? I do. I actually think that it's almost like Lori's inside of CVS, um, where, where she where she um, actually sees us trying to do that. Um, the the element that you know, the dimension that I would I would add to what the other panelists have said is, you know, I think we have to to build more partnerships and different partnerships for talent acquisition. Um, in addition to kind of the traditional approaches. And that's something that we've been spending more time to, to actively cultivate who those partners are. And you know, there's, there's partners who specialize in bringing us diverse talent, which is really important to us. Uh, as a company, one of our you know, core values is diversity and, and making sure that the people who 
work here at CVS reflect the diversity of the people and the communities that we want to serve. So that's one kind of cohort of, of talent that we're looking for is, is going to be focused on that. We're looking for, you know, I'd say another cohort of uh, early career talent where we absolutely understand that they're not going to have necessarily the fully developed skills. They're not going to have the experiences. And so this is where Lori's point comes into play, um, you know, with, with, with CVS, where we do have a program where we pull talent in. There is a training and grooming process and what I call an incubator team that they can go to where there is a support structure as part of that incubation team which recognizes that this is early career talent. They might not have all the skills, they might not have all the experiences, but they certainly have the aptitude um, as sourced by the talent acquisition partner. And we're gonna lean in and this whole team structure is built around incubating talent of that nature. And then once we feel that they're ready, and, and a number of these individuals are truly in apprenticeships, um, up to a year in some cases, once we determine that they're ready, we internally then, um, you know, identify the right first career step within CVS technology for that talent. And so we have an intentional approach around early career. And then the other cohort that, I, that I've mentioned is, you know, again, what Lori was saying, there's a lot of people that we know are on the sidelines. Very talented individuals, experienced individuals who, you know, we need to we need to compel back into, you know, maybe a non-traditional work pattern. And, you know, that's where we, I think, have more work to do, uh, where obviously flexibility and schedules really matters. Uh, we need to think about this as maybe working on, you know, particular opportunities rather than kind of a traditional full-time, you know, 40 hour week construct. And so we really have to think about how to, how to be more flexible for that, for that cohort. But there's, there's a lot of talent on the sidelines that we need to be able to tap into. So that's the other thing that we're working on. That's really interesting. And I, I, you know, I think a lot of the points that all of you have made, sorry, uh, Karen, did you want to add something really quick and then? I did. I just wanted to kind of maybe emphasize Rashawn's last point. Um, I, in the U.S., um, I know we all have a global, you know, footprint, but in the U.S. alone, there are some 70 million folks that we consider um, to be skilled through alternate routes. So they're kind of stars is what they're called um, in the literature. And, and, and these are folks who, again, may not have the academic credentials, may not have uh, the most traditional career path, but definitely are on the sidelines often and have the potential to um, go further than where they are. And so it's exciting to hear about all these uh, different programs to to kind of think creatively about pulling in different talent, whether it's early stage career or folks without an official degree. And if I didn't say it, I'll just say it one more time that like we've seen this increase in roles on our platform for jobs that don't require a degree. So it's not just employers, how they hire, but it's also actually saying this job does not require a college degree. Um, and it's not just entry level jobs. These are actually, you know, more advanced jobs. So we're starting to see a shift there um, to Rohan's point about, uh, excuse me, Roshan's point about how we um, think about pulling in um, talent from all kinds of diverse, um, you know, places across our community. That's, that's really interesting, Karen. I think it, it does tie into this broader question of how valuable a college degree really is moving forward, especially with the, you know, the improvement and increased usage of uh, these various alternative um, routes to, to kind of gaining skills. Uh, you know, could, could you maybe say a bit more on that? Actually, I'm very curious. Um, you're, you're seeing an increase on, on the platform of um, job postings that don't require alternate degrees. Just how significant is that? And, and maybe when we open it up to everyone else, you know, would people care to speculate on you know, the, the, the future of college in, in a sense, like is, is this going to continue as a trend where, you know, more and more people are going to be using alternative uh, pathways to, to you know, getting jobs or traditionally considered high skill requiring degrees? Can, can I kick us off a little bit with just some facts yeah, and then please, I'll please. turn it over to the folks who are in the, in the <laughs> front lines of it? Um, so one of the things we've seen is like uh, right now, I think it's one in five uh, jobs don't require a college degree. That's up from, I believe, one in six. So it's it's slowly, 
you know, it's slowly increasing year by year. Um, the other thing that I think it, that that we're seeing is like, no, you don't you don't have to go to college. It definitely helps. It's a super strong signal. Economists know this. Um, and partly it's because of the network. So I just want to quickly just talk, touch on that idea that like the network is incredibly powerful about who you know, where you grew up. We know that uh, where you grew up, the zip code, the school you went to and your first job, the company you, you worked at for your first job, create incredibly powerful network for um, members. And that almost amplifies by 10 times their opportunities um, to access roles. So conversely, folks without all those advantages um, of zip code where they grew up and, and, and the college they went to um, don't have those advantages. And so I think it's also really incumbent upon us to th think about how do we broaden the talent pool? Um, and we're starting to see with this focus on wanting to have inclusive workplaces and diverse workplaces with diverse perspectives, we're starting to see employers really seize that opportunity to kind of do things differently. So I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists from here. Yeah, Jim, please. So we, we work with a number of different groups, uh, whether it be Year Up, NPower, 110, Launch Code, Girls That Code, and you get a mix of amazing talent, uh, without college degrees, some with um, junior degrees, some with full degrees, but different backgrounds, maybe not in IT, maybe in psychology or what have you. And what we've seen through that process, and we do something similar with Roshan highlighted, we do cohorts. So we might do a cohort of the year up, a program that usually don't have a college degree, but they have a ton of aptitude. We might get, we have, we have 20 today, we do 20 at a time, and we'll, we'll get them working with us for six months to nine months, and then we usually hire one to two out of that, and if not more. And even if they don't stay with us, they've gotten some experience and skills that they can then take to other companies to move forward. So we're making a big effort in that, and things like uh, Launch Code, I did that when I was with another company in St. Louis, where you get people from all different backgrounds, they get co-trained on how to develop in, in core technical skills. It's usually a very diverse audience. Uh, there's a lot of women that actually uh, participate that in as well. And we've also been able to attract talent that way. So we're looking at very different areas. And we've had to have some discussions internal around the requirements around a degree and open up how we post roles, how we think about those roles. And I think Rashawn made another really good point is you've got to look at how they get embedded into your organization. They may not have all the skills you'd expect. You, managers have to help them and coach them to get them to where they need to be. And you've really got to own that. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to retain them or they'll never become part of your nucleus. So uh, I think we're all learning as we go here, but we're all very aggressively looking at how do we get to all talent and give them opportunities. And we're all in global organizations, amazing talent outside the U.S. as well, and we're doing something similar in Brazil, we're doing something similar in Asia to be able to, again, track talent on a global stage. That's 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 really interesting, Jim. And, and I, I'm realizing we're getting close on time here. So Laura, do you wanna close us off? So I, I would just say really quickly, there's a lot of discussion about, can you bring your authentic self to work? And if you can't, are you going to work there? And so again, I go back to, are companies strong in articulating what's important to them versus what's not? I've seen a lot of people fail in a company, even if they have the skill set, if they don't speak the same narrative of peers that maybe have that college degree, or if they dress differently. And, and so what are the norms for the company culture? And are those clearly articulated in the interview process besides the skill set? So, so if you're, if you're allowed to come to work in a hoodie and you can speak in a shorthand and use what my children, how they text versus how I text, they make fun of me. Is that normal and okay in your corporate culture so that they can authentically come up? come into the to the professional channels that way or are you expecting them to to use the oxford dictionary of grammar and and if they don't that is unacceptable so i think i think that's another disconnect that companies have right now with talent and and this idea that you're going to bring in a skill set but but are you bringing the whole person to work and what are your professional norms and and um mores of of behavior and are you able to train on those things as well which ones are non-negotiable which ones aren't no negotiable we did an experiment where we hired internally a bunch of people without a college degree from 
from um, hospitality industry to to try and upskill some folks. And one of the things that we realized is what we do for a living is talk to people like all of you about changing jobs. And there has to be a level of a communication style that is different than perhaps if somebody was behind the scenes coding and, and the code is the most important thing. So I think companies really need to understand what department they're coming into, what is what is acceptable for the authentic self along with the skill set and how are we training on both so that they can be successful alongside whatever peers they're working with which with whatever backgrounds and that's not that's not it's easier said than done it's tricky it really shows you just how important uh, you know culture is to making all of this actually uh, happen in practice. Well, yeah, thank you all for, for, for your time. I think we learned so much from the session about, you know, uh, mission driven work, the use of technology in the workforce and how that's changing, um, all these alternative talent, talent pipelines and some very provocative stuff on, you know, what the future of what a college degree might mean. Um, so we'll have many more sessions like this. So I, I encourage you all to, uh, you know, stick with, uh, this conference, um, and uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Jim, Karen, Roshan, and, and Lori for your time. I learned a lot.